This is your favorite professor clocking in to talk to you about uh, protein synthesis or translation, as it's formally known as. So the reason why this is important is because this is um, where you get the transfer or the creation of genotype that then correlates to phenotype. So genotype is what makes us, per se, phenotypically human, right? And um, gene expression allows us to be phenotypically human, and it allows alterations um, in phenotypes. So when we talk about phenotypes, we really talk about, again, that genetic makeup or your genotype. So in order to express a genotype, you need to go from genes to proteins. Um, so we've covered all the other aspects um, of going from DNA into RNA. Um, or transcription, but we haven't yet talked about where you go next. So we haven't really talked about how you actually get a protein from a gene. So probably a good idea to talk about that. So that's what we're going to do. Now, before we can go talking about translation, we have to talk about proteins themselves. Um, and when we talk about proteins, we take a step back and think about what they're made of. Now, if you remember from your high school bio class or your intro bio class in undergrad, we all know that proteins are made of amino acids. Now, amino acids are what we call the building blocks of life. And there are 20 that are known to exist. Um, they are represented conveniently right here for you. Um, so amino acids are organic molecules that contain both a carboxyl and amino group. So here's your carboxyl group and amino. Now, typically, um, the universal way of seeing an amino acid or having an amino acid written is to have the deionized form. So you'd have your regular carboxyl group, meaning you have a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen and also single bonded to a hydroxyl group and then an amino group or NH2. Now, again, these are your um, ionized form. So this is a chart of your amino acids at their neutral pH. So a neutral pH, um, they're going to exist as dipolar ions because their alpha carboxyl and alpha amino groups are ionized. So that's what we're seeing here. But again, your standard way of seeing amino acids written is for this to not be ionized. So you'd have a regular carboxyl group, meaning you have a hydroxyl here, and then your amino or NH2. Anyway, this is a nice image because it clearly lays out the different um, properties of the amino acids. So um, before we move on, each possesses a center carbon and that holds four functional groups. So we discussed two, your amino group and your carboxyl group. Here's your central or asymmetric carbon. Um, the third group is this little lone hydrogen here. And then your fourth is this colored box that you see. Um, now this colored box is what's called a side chain. Now they're actually not colored, they're just highlighted here for your viewing pleasure. But they represent, um, again, a side chain or what's called an R group. Now this is a variant group. So each amino acid um, universally has this same backbone, right? They have your amino group, the asymmetric carbon, um, and because they have an asymmetric carbon, that means they have isomers um, because they have a 3D shape. So you get chiralty, you get your L and D forms, which are mirror images, but um, we don't want to talk about that. That's all scary stuff. Um, not really, just nobody likes to talk about it. So then the rest of the backbone, you have um, your hydrogen and your carboxyl. That's the universal backbone, right, for your amino acid. And then you get variation right here at that R group. So the physical and chemical properties of the side chain determines the unique characteristics of a particular amino acid. Um, here, again, each one is grouped by their, um, or according to the chemical properties of their side chains or R group. 
So these are amino acids. Where's the mouse? Here it is. These are amino acids with um, nonpolar side chains, meaning they are going to have hydrophobic behaviors or water fearing. Um, this group had our amino acids with polar side chains, meaning they're hydrophilic amino acids. And then you have your amino acids that are electrically charged or have electrically charged side chains. And they're subdivided into two groups. You have those that are acidic and those that are basic. Um, now, because they're charged, both your acidic and your basic um, amino acids will um, exhibit hydrophilic behavior. All right, so when you link little amino acids together, you form what's called a polypeptide chain. Now, um, this is done through condensation or dehydration synthesis uh, reactions. And they form what's called a peptide bond. That's, where's the mouse? Here it is. Peptide bond um, that occurs between the carboxyl group of one amino acid, right here. Why do I keep losing the mouse? Right here and the amino group of the other um, amino acid. So peptide bonds really, they're the only important um, bond here or at this current moment in time to think about. Um, so what you end up getting is this polypeptide that has a repetitive backbone of um, that, that universal backbone and then your side groups um, extending off of it. So again, you have your carboxyl group, you're going to bond to the other amino acid. You're gonna bond, if you have the carboxyl group here, you're gonna to bond to the amino group of the other amino acid. Um, you do that by dehydration synthesis, which is the removal of a water molecule. Um, so you remove the hydroxyl group off of your carboxyl and one of the hydrogens off of that amine group that links those two amino acids together um, by forming a peptide bond. Now, when we talk about polypeptides or just amino acids in general, there isn't a real um, or a, um, a noted five prime and three prime end. Um, instead, we refer to an N terminus and C terminus. So your N terminus is going to be located where there is an N or a nitrogen. And oh, look, that's right here in the amine group. So your amino or your amine serves as the N terminus. On the other side, you have your C terminus or your carboxyl terminus. So your C terminus occurs where that carboxyl group is. Your N terminus occurs where the amine or amino group is. Now, if you wanted to think of this in terms or line it up to, um, a strand of mRNA, you would line this up so that the amino group lines up with the five prime end of the mRNA. Your carboxyl group lines up with the three prime end. So five prime end of mRNA correlates to the end terminus of your amino acid or your polypeptide. And the three prime end of your mRNA correlates to the um, C terminus or carboxyl terminus end of your amino acid or um, polypeptide. All right, so there are four levels of organization for proteins. Um, the first one, or the one that we were just discussing, again, is your primary structure. This is just your unique sequence of amino acids. Um, and those chains of amino acids, again, they represent your primary structure. Um, and the precise linking of the amino acids and that, that polypeptide, um, or the ones that are involved, will influence the actual conformation of your protein, and therefore its 3D image or its topology. So moving a step down, you go into your secondary structure, and that's um, referring to internal bonding or the formation of hydrogen bonds between different amino acids. And um, depending on where you have those hydrogen bonds forming, you get either this alpha helix shape, which is a helical shape, or you get something that looks like an accordion. This is your pleated sheet. 
Um, okay, so that's all great. We still don't have a functional protein. This is just your little polypeptide. So then, oh my goodness gracious. Okay, so then we move on to your tertiary structure. Um, so this is referring to your the 3D structure um, or the overall shape of a polypeptide resulting from interactions between your R groups. So this is when the R groups of the amino acids come into play um, in tertiary structure. Um, so their chemical properties um, of each side group, again, influences what kind of bonds can form. Um, they influence how they interact and where those interactions will occur. Those interactions themselves influence the shape. So here you have um, the additional folding and compaction to get a 3D shape. That's determined by the chemical characteristics and therefore behavior of those R groups. Um, again, that's going to determine where certain bonds form, which bonds form or which interactions occur, um, and that's going to influence the uh, conformational folding. So at this point, it's not clearly defined. It's not really clearly defined until you get into quaternary structure. Um, often, full proteins contain um, multiple polypeptides that um, are joined together. So in your quaternary stage, this is where you have the interactions between different polypeptides. So polypeptide A is going to start joining to polypeptide uh, B to form some protein. Um, and then you get, usually from there, you get a functional protein. Okay, cool. So that's all fine and dandy, but what is the point? Well, what happens if you um, have a mutation that comes along and replaces an amino acid with one of a different chemical category? Well, you would have a very big conundrum. That's what you would have. Um, so what would happen is that amino acid would behave differently chemically. Um, because of that different chemical behavior, you alter the interactions that are made. Thus, you alter the protein shape. That alteration in shape then goes on to influence how the protein behaves with other proteins. Um, and then you just have a whole cascade effect from there. So a codon of DNA dictates the mRNA codon, right? And then your mRNA codon dictates the amino acid coded for. Um, and your amino acids then code for what protein is produced. So the polypeptide chain produced from your amino acid chain um, influences the conformation of the protein and its conformation determines how it works. So even a slight change in your primary structure can affect a protein's conformation and ability to function. So I always say if you had to choose, absolutely had to choose a mutation, you would want to choose one that um, where you have an amino acid being switched with another amino acid of the same um, chemical property, or it has the same polar properties as the non-mutant. Um, because by doing so, you would have them chemically behave the same. So if you had to choose to do a mutation, you could do an alanine and a valine, because they're not going to be the same amino acid, but they're going to at least behave the same chemically. So less likely to influence shape. Now, a classic example of this, where you have um, a mutation gone rogue, as I like to say, um, is with hemoglobin, right? So a change in the 3D representation of this protein has a huge um, phenotypic impact in that you end up having an individual with sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. Um, so here's good old hemoglobin. We all know about hemoglobin. This is the oxygen binding protein of your red blood cells. Um, myoglobin also carries oxygen, but we're not talking about that. So there are four polypeptide subunits that make up your hemoglobin structure. You have um, two alpha chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains. 
Now, the alpha chains are produced by two different genes. You have um, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Each one is expressed. Um, and they result in almost identical subunits. Um, so we tend to think of the two alpha genes as dimers. Um, but anyway, so the beta chains come from the same gene, on the other hand. Um, the beta gene is uh, expressed twice in adults. So then each of these little subunits has um, a non-polypeptide component called heme. Um, and the heme has an iron atom attached to it, and this is what actually binds your oxygen. Now this is the hemoglobin structure for adults. Um, interestingly, you'll actually have um, different genes that are expressed in um, embryo and fetal hemoglobin. So as an embryo, um, you express the epsilon gene instead of beta, and that produces what's known as the beta equivalent or the equivalent of the beta subunit for the embryo. When you're a fetus, you switch from using the epsilon gene to expressing two gamma genes, gamma A and gamma G. Those are your fetal equivalents of the beta subunit. And then about 18 weeks after birth, you'll start expressing um, the adult genes, um, which is your beta. Now, also as a fetus, um, you'll express a gene called delta. Um, this is kind of like an intermediate. It's expressed at different times and occasions. Um, so that's for your beta subunit, which from correct occurs at chromosome 11. Jumping over to chromosome 16, um, you also see different genes expressed for um, the alpha genes. So in the embryo and fetus, um, they express two zeta genes, zeta 1 and zeta 2. And then again, approximately 18 weeks after birth, they start expressing the adult um, alpha genes, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Um, now, interestingly, you don't entirely stop expressing the gamma gene. Um, so the adult average will actually contain approximately 1% of fetal hemoglobin. Uh, fun fact, you can tell your friends that. Um, hope a nice glass of wine or beer. Anyway, so when we're talking about sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, um, this is occurring because of a very rude mutation. Um, so what's happening here is, well, before I continue, the beta subunit has what are called 146 different amino acid residues. Now in the normal beta subunit, you have, um, an amino acid called glutamic acid expressed at the sixth position or um, at amino acid six in the polypeptide. Um, now this, when you have this expression of the glutamic acid, you get your normal or quote unquote normal um, allele, which we indicate as this here, HBA. Um, so this is also known as the BA allele for the beta gene. Um, and when you normally have HBA or your um, BA allele for the beta gene, you get a DNA sequence that encodes for your glutamic acid and everything is all happy in the world. Now, sometimes certain factors come along and you get a substitution. And in sickle cell disease, that substitution occurs again at chromosome position six um, or polypeptide position amino acid six. Um, and instead of glutamic acid, you get this thing called valine. Now, we go back and we look at our handy dandy little chart here. Here's a 
glutamate or glutamic acid situated right down here. Glutamic acid is an electrically charged acidic amino acid. Okay, so where's valine? Well, valine is up here. Valine is nonpolar, meaning it's completely, entirely electrically neutral. That's a big problem. So you have two, oh, hello, Figaro. You have two very different amino acids here in terms of their chemical behavior. And again, that's gonna have profound impacts on phenotype. So because of that mutation, and interestingly, it's just because of one um, base substitution. So instead of coding for um, A here for adenine, um, you have uracil, um, or instead of, uh, yeah, instead of having the adenine. So just because of that small little base substitution, you code, get a different codon, which means you get a different um, amino acid. Now that's not always the case, but in this particular instance, this codon codes for a different amino acid of a different chemical property. Um, so with this, you get sickle cell disease. Um, and that change in your primary structure for hemoglobin um, causes your normal red blood cells, which are disc shaped, um, to become abnormally shaped. So these little hemoglobin molecules start to crystallize, um, which deforms your red blood cells into what we call a sickle shape, or this almost crescent moon-like shape. Um, they also become very sticky and start clumping together. Um, this can start to clog your blood vessels, almost like um, arthrosclerosis, and impede blood flow. Um, some of them can also pierce through blood vessels um, and cause an individual to start bleeding um, or go into sickle cell crisis. Okay, so, oh, and here's the um, whole genetics of it in case you're interested. So um, individuals with, you can either have uh, sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. Um, so sickle cell disease is when you express both mutant alleles, which is your HBS. Um, if you express HBA and HBS, you are what's called a carrier. Um, so in this case, uh, sickle cell represents or is an example of what we call codominance, meaning it's not one or the either as far as phenotype related to genotype. Here you're expressing both. So individuals that are carriers have normal red blood cells, but they also will have some of these sickle-shaped ones. Um, Sometimes it doesn't cause a problem, sometimes it does. Um, but when you have an individual or offspring with both of your mutant alleles, um, they will have what's called sickle cell disease. This is, um, I think we just refer to this as sickle cell anemia. This is sickle cell disease. Um, individuals of this genotype do not live long. There's a very uh, stunted lifespan um, and it's extremely, difficult to see and and watch and talk about. Um, there's some more information. Oh, so um, interestingly, there's this neat correlation um, evolutionarily as to why sickle cell trait is still around. So it's been around for decades um, throughout evolutionary history. And usually, you would expect to see something of this caliber to have been um, kind of weaned out of um, evolutionary history, almost like through natural selection, except it has not. Um, so there was this big question as to why it still exists in evolutionary history. And there's actually this um, correlation between um, sickle cell anemia or the sickle cell trait and um, having resistance to malaria or reducing your malaria symptoms. So they think the reason why 
your sickle cell trait has stuck around for so long is because of that um, that relationship with uh, decreasing your um, risk for malaria or decreasing um, the symptoms that persist when you do uh, have malaria. Okay, so we were blabbing away about proteins, then we still haven't talked about proteins and how proteins or polypeptides are formed in regards to um, the flow of genetic information. So the final step in creation of proteins from DNA is what's called translation. Um, translation is what I like to refer to as RNA-directed synthesis of a polypeptide. In short terms, protein synthesis. Um, it's also, in other words, how ribosomes utilize your mRNA to produce a polypeptide. So here's your mRNA that's created from transcription, and that's being translated into your polypeptide. All right, so um, there's a large cast of characters that are involved. Um, actually, not that large, but there are some characters that are involved. Um, the three important components that are required to carry out the process are these guys here. So you need mRNA, right? mRNA is serving as the messenger here, um, the actual vehicle for bringing in um, the genetic template, per se. Then you have tRNA. tRNA is your interpreter. Um, this is what's going to go through and actually read that strand of, um, well, not, this won't do the reading, but is going to um, interact with the mRNA strand to determine the amino acid that um, occurs. And then your ribosome. So ribosomes serve as the site of translation. Now, translation is occurring in the cytoplasm, but the actual specific location of translation is at the ribosome or in the ribosome. Your ribosome you can think of as your cellular factory. Um, so these guys are your catalytic enzymes if you want to think of it that way. And then the, TR the mRNA is moved through your ribosome. This is the ribosome here. Your um, cellular factory, and its genetic message is translated into amino acids. Now, the message itself is a series of codons along a mo um, mRNA molecule, um, and then your tRNA will base pair to that mRNA using its anticodon. Now, the anticodon is the complement to your mRNA codon. So if you have an mRNA codon that's UUU, the tRNA that's complementary to this mRNA codon, or the one that will base pair to it, will have the anticodon AAA. Now, at the other end of your little tRNA molecule is the amino acid. The amino acid it carries correlates to the mRNA codon, um, not its anticodon. A lot of people will get mixed up here, they look and they try to code your um, anticodon as they go, they take the anticodon to a codon table and use that to determine the amino acid. Only if you have that um, translation into your mRNA codon. So if you're trying to figure out what amino acid is attached or figure out what um, yeah, what amino acid will be attached? You have to look at your mRNA codon. So amino acid is also is going to be complementary to this anticodon. Um, I think that's all just done to confuse everybody. It's actually not. It's very important for base pairing. But um, so the um, cytoplasm will actually keep uh, stock of all these different amino acids. Um, and the function of the tRNA is to attach with its proper amino acid in the cytoplasm and then carry that amino acid into the ribosome. Um, 
and again, the cell keeps itself with cytoplasm stocked with all 20 amino acids. So these tRNA, they will be recycled. So once they're used, they get dis um, discarded and then they'll pick up a new amino acid um, from the ones that are stocked in the cytoplasm. Um, now each molecule of tRNA is not identical. Um, again, it's correlating to a particular mRNA codon um, and that particular mRNA codon that it relates to um, determines the amino acid that the tRNA carries. Um, so as the tRNA molecule arrives at the ribosome, it bears a specific amino acid. Um, this is amino acid that's connected to the three prime attachment site and it's attached by um, an enzyme called amino, uh, what's it called? Amino acetyl tRNA synthase. And um, again, that amino acid correlates to the mRNA codon. It's going to be opposite of your anticodon. Um, so when they base pair, the amino acid that's carried by the tRNA is passed onto a growing polypeptide chain. So again, your tRNA, by doing this, acts as the translator between mRNA and protein by bringing in that specific amino acid coded for by the mRNA codon. Okay. So um, again, your ribosome serves as the cellular factory uh, responsible for protein synthesis. Its catalytic function is to create peptide bonds. Um, so the ribosome consists of two different subunits. You have the large subunit and the small subunit. And as I say to my class all the time, the creativity here kills me, right? Naming in biology and all spheres of biology is just a riot. I can't handle it. Um, so you, here's your large subunit. It's large. Here's your small subunit. It is small. Um, so inside the ribosome, the amino acids are linked together into a chain, um, and that's done through multiple biochemical reactions, which we'll discuss in a hot second. So different genes encode for these different subunits um, that you see over here. In fact, um, each of the components um, themselves that create those subunits are um, created by different genes. So that's why, um, you know, that whole notion of DNA coding for a unique sequence of RNA is so on point. Um, because these genes that are involved here, instead of coding for a protein, they code for the RNA structures. And this RNA structure happens to play a very crucial role in cellular functioning. Um, now, the subunits themselves are, uh, I like this picture better. Okay, so the subunits themselves are composed of what's called ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. So that's very important to remember. There's two principal components of both subunits, the large and the small subunits. You have ribosomal proteins and your ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. All right, so what are the basic functions of RNA? Well, there's two. RNA carries information and it can catalyze. In other words, it can act as an enzyme. All right, great. Now, based on that understanding, you can figure out what the purpose of RNA serves in the ribosome. Because at this point, you're probably thinking, why would the ribosome have our RNA? Like, what's the point of that? Well, it's actually very important. So um, there's three purposes. First is that your rRNA or your ribosomal RNA um, actually serves to catalyze the peptide bond formation. Second is that the rRNA in the small subunit base pairs with um, your mRNA at the Shine Del Giorno sequence to initiate translation. And third, is that just in general, it makes a part of the structure um, and serves part in the ribosomal shape. So um, 
the five prime UTR will in the mRNA will base pair with um, your um, rRNA that's in the small subunit. Um, and that helps to situate the mRNA at the proper location or um, at the proper start site. So your um, actual ribosomal binding site per se is again this thing called a shine del Jarno sequence. And then the ribosome will translate the mRNA in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay. So um, your prokaryote and eukaryote ribosomes, pretty darn similar. Um, your eukaryotic ribosomes are generally larger. Um, they're typically 80s um, S or 80 Spegberg coefficients. Um, the large subunit contains three rRNA molecules and 49 proteins, while the small subunit contains one RNA, I'm uh, sorry, one rRNA and 33 proteins. Your prokaryotic um, ribosomes are much smaller in size. They're only about 70 Spedberg coefficients. Um, so they have two pieces or two molecules of rRNA and 31 proteins in their large subunits. Um, and in the small subunit, they have one rRNA and 21 proteins. Now, the 28S in the, um, sorry, the 28S rRNA in your large subunit of the eukaryotic ribosome and your 23S rRNA in the prokaryote. These are what are responsible for building your polypeptide bonds. The 18S, come here, mouse. The 18S in your small subunit of the eukaryote and 16S rRNA in the small subunit for the prokaryote um, are what we call fingerprinting genes. So they are what base pair with the mRNA to initiate translation. So when that um, small subunit of the ribosome attaches to your mRNA at the um, shine del Jarno sequence in the 5' prime UTR, it's binding to the mRNA because of the 16S or the 18S. 18S if you're eukaryotic, 16S if you're prokaryotic. Um, So in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, um, your large and small subunits will join to form the full functional ribosome. Um, and they will only attach together to form that functional ribosome when they attach to an mRNA molecule. Otherwise, in the cytoplasm, they're just existing as separate um, large and small subunits. They'll only come together to form your ribosome when they're attached to the mRNA. Okay, so um, your ribosome acts as what's called, a, or I should say, your ribosome has what's known as peptidyl transferase activity. Um, and this is because of your 23S and 28S rRNA. Um, in that large subunit. Um, both of those allow for um, the formation of peptide bonds. Those peptide bonds are formed by your peptidyl transferase. Now, peptidyl transferase is what's called um, a ribo ribozyme. This refers to RNA molecules that function as enzymes. And again, its enzymatic property is the formation of your peptide bonds. Um, and those peptide bonds are going to form between the amino, amino acids that are being brought in by your tRNA. Okay, so um, here's the amino, the tRNA. It's going to bring in your little amino acid into the ribosome. Um, in translation, a single tRNA molecule can be used repeatedly. Um, it picks up its associated amino acid from the cytoplasm 
deposits it in the ribosome and then will leave the ribosome to pick up another amino acid. Um, so this here is your flattened shape. This is the secondary structure um, of tRNA, and it's what we refer to as the clover shape. Its 3D shape is this guy over here, this L-shaped looking thing. Um, and this is an example of your double-stranded RNA. So usually you'll see RNA molecules that are single-stranded. Um, because the um, internal uh, base pairing um, or hydrogen bonding of complementary base pairs that fold back on themselves, you get this double-stranded RNA structure. That gives it this unique uh, 3D shape as an upside-down L. Very fancy. Um, so going back to the flat secondary structure, so there are four double-stranded strands, um, three of which have a single stranded loop at the end. Now your one has what's called the anticodon. Um, this is a triplet uh, sequence that is going to be complementary to the mRNA codon. So here, this anticodon is CGC, that means it base pairs to the mRNA codon G, C, G. Okay. Um, and then up here, you have this three prime binding site. Now this is the three prime binding site for the amino acid. Um, the identity of the amino, amino acid attached at that um, binding site is based on the anticodon that will bind to the mRNA codon. Um, so that amino acid is joined to the correct tRNA by, again, an enzyme called amino acetyl tRNA synthase. Um, and that catalyzes uh, a covalent bond between the amino acid and that three prime binding site. Um, and it does this through hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is the addition of a water molecule. Um, typically to break bonds, but here um, you're actually using it to put on this little um, alene and or whatever amino acid you have here. And that's going, when you have that amino acid attached, it's going to activate the amino acid. Um, when you have the activated amino acid, you have what's called your amino acetyl tRNA. It's just an activated tRNA carrying its complementary or proper amino acid. Um, so after tRNA, oh, you know what? So when you have your anticodon, so your anticodon lines up with the mRNA, your mRNA codon runs five prime to three prime, right? Your anticodon, since it's complementary is going to run three prime to five prime. So this would be the three prime end and this will be the five prime end. That lines up to the five prime end and three prime end of your mRNA. Uh, just in case I was to ever ask you a question about that. Hint. Okay, so back to what I was saying. So after the tRNA is correctly matched up with its associated amino acid, um, the anticodon of your amino acetyl tRNA must be matched to its mRNA codon. Now, this is where an interesting thing called wobble base pairing comes into play. We say that the base pairing between your tRNA anticodon and mRNA codon is governed by wobble base pairing. Um, so you have the same conventional uh, nucleotide bases for mRNA. Um, or that you have with mRNA. Um, you have um, uracil, you have guanine, you have adenine and cytosine. And uracil base pairs or matches up with adenine. Your Gs still match up with your Cs. Um, but the thing with wobble base pairing 
is that the rules for base pairing between the third bases of your tRNA and your mRNA, which are these guys here, they're relaxed. So they're not as stringent per se. Um, for example, this, uh, where is he? This guy here. Um, the U at the five prime end of the of uh, the anticodon on the tRNA, uh, the five prime end, remember, for your tRNA is going to be this side right here, meaning this is your three prime end for your mRNA codon. So that little U at this five prime end of your tRNA, um, the five prime end of it, can base pair with either an A or a G in the third position at the three prime end. So here's the, three, the third position at the three prime end of your mRNA codon. Now there's four main wobble base pairs um, and the wobble base pairs don't follow conventional base pairing rules. Um, so you can have um, guanine base pair to uracil or GU, that's this guy here. You can have um, this thing called hypoxanthine, um, which is correlated by an I. So you can have um, hypoxanthine base pair with uracil, or it can base pair with adenine, or it can base pair with cytosine. All these combinations here. Um, so this relaxed ruling allows versatility and decreases the number of tRNAs that are required by the cell. All right, so um, when we talk about translation, there are three main stages. There are the three main stages that you um, have for transcription. They are simply initiation, elongation, and termination. So, Initiation is when you get the intact ribosome onto the mRNA and the presence of tRNA. So translation initiation begins when the small subunit of the ribosome attaches to the ribosom ribosomal binding site. Now your ribosomal binding site is this shine gel jarno sequence. And that shine jarno sequence is situated in the 5' UTR of the mRNA. Um, so base pairing between the mRNA and RNA in your small subunit of the ribosome, that's where it occurs. That situates the small subunit um, onto the mRNA and situates the mRNA in the correct location. Um, and the part of the small subunit that's base pairing with it is that 16S RNA, uh, 16S RNA. So the 16S RNA in your small subunit of the ribosome base pairs with the shine del Jarno sequence and the 5' prime UTR of your mRNA. And again, this aligns the start codon with, with, with what will become your future P site. In the ribosome. Um, there's three sites that will form. You have an A site, a P site, and an E site. Um, now once the um, mRNA is attached to the small subunit, something called an initiator tRNA will enter and bind. Now your initiator tRNA is N-formalin methionyl tRNA or just tRNA. It's an amino acid um, tRNA that carries your amino acid methionine. Now since it's carrying methionine, it carries um, an anticodon UAC. That anticodon base pairs with the complementary mRNA codon AUG. Now AUG. Wow, that's very familiar. Yes, it should be very familiar because that's the universal start codon. So that's why your little um, initiator tRNA carrying your methionine is your initiator tRNA because it base pairs with 
the mRNA start codon AUG. So the initiator tRNA, again, carrying or containing your methionine, hydrogen bonds to the start codon on the mRNA. And by doing so, it occupies what's for, referred to as the future P site. Once your initiator tRNA has bound to the mRNA, your large subunit of the ribosome will bind. Um, now this, when it binds, it creates the formal um, sites inside the ribosome. You have the formal A site, P site, and E site. Um, the P site, or a peptidyl tRNA site, holds the tRNA carrying the growing polypeptide strand. So you'll see a um, tRNA molecule in here that has your start um, amino acid or your methionine and then whatever amino acids are brought in. So this is the one that's carrying your growing polypeptide strand or polypeptide chain. The A site or amino acid, where's the mouth? Amino acetyl tRNA site holds the tRNA that's carrying the next amino acid, acid to be added to your polypeptide strand. So tRNA enters, base pairs to whatever mRNA codon is here, if it's the correct tRNA, meaning it carries the correct anticodon. Base pairs at the, so it situates at the A site, and then it will move to, well, it doesn't move to your ribosome moves, but we'll get there. So then it's transferred to the P site. At the P site, that's when it carries the growing polypeptide strand. Um, the polypeptide strand is actually transferred from your P site to the A site as it enters the P site. And then once that happens, it'll pass on this polypeptide chain to the next tRNA to enter. And that tRNA that's in the P site will be moved to the E site. Your E site is your exit site. So this is where discharged tRNAs leave the ribosome from. And then they'll be pushed out into the cytoplasm where they'll be paired to their complementary amino acid and we'll go through the whole cycle again. Um, now the cell itself requires energy to complete this. Um, that energy comes from GTP. Um, or guanine triphosphate. All right, so we've gone through initiation. Um, once you have the formation of or the attachment of your large subunit, um, you have the creation or the um, attachment of your large subunit and your small subunit that forms the full functional ribosome then you can move into elongation. So in the elongation, amino acids are added to the growing chain in a four-step cycle. So the first is what I call codon recognition. Um, a tRNA enters the ribosome at the empty A site, which will be this guy here. So here's your start tRNA. He's already base paired there. You have your um, first little new tRNA to, to enter the ribosome. Um, it will enter, um, and if it contains the correct anticodon for this mRNA codon, it will base pair to that mRNA codon and occupy the A site. Um, then a peptide bond is formed between the new A site um, amino acid and um, your P site amino acid. So this is forming um, between the carboxyl end um, and the amino acid teal end, sorry, amino acid end. So what happens is this amino acid is gonna be situated, stupid mouse, this amino acid is gonna be situated at the carboxyl end of the growing polypeptide strand um, that's in the P site. Um, so your poly, sorry, your peptide bond formation 
is catalyzed by, again, peptidyl transferase. Um, and that's occurring um, from this 28S, or um, if you're eukaryote, or 23S, if you're prokaryote, rRNA in the large ribosomal subunit. Um, and again, that's because of the peptidyl transferase activity. So this attaches the um, polypeptide to the amino acid of the tRNA in the A site. Um, and again, that's all energized by GTP. And each amino acid is added to the carboxyl end of the polypeptide. So you're creating polypeptide from N terminus to C terminus, adding to the C terminal end. Um, now, following this, going back, so you have the formation of the peptide bond due to peptidyl transferase activity. This amino acid is added to the carboxyl end of the amino acid or your growing polypeptide strand. Um, at this, the ribosome makes what's called one translocation. So one translocation is basically one movement forward the length of one codon, um, as shown right here. Oh my goodness, this mouse right here. So your ribosome moves forward or moves towards the three prime end of your mRNA, the length of one codon. This is one translocation. When it translocates, the tRNAs are shifted one site over. So this A site tRNA now occupies the P site. And in the P site, it carries um, the growing amino acid, or sorry, growing polypeptide chain. The start or your initiator tRNA that had occupied the P site is now moved to your E site. So here's your formerly initiator tRNA. Here's the um, former A site tRNA. Since your tRNA um, is situated in the E site, that means it has dis, um, discarded its amino acid. It's now of no use, so it is um, ejected from the ribosome. So again, your E site is the ejection or exit site. So um, your little tRNA in the E site is discharged, and then the cycle will um, restart. You'll have a new um, tRNA that has the correct anticodon base pair to the complementary mRNA codon, um, and it carries in a new amino acid. You have uh, peptidyl transferase activity um, occur in the large a subunit of the ribosome that forms a polypeptide bond between the um, carboxyl or C terminus of this amino acid and the amine or your N terminus of this amino acid. So you're growing your polypeptide chain at the C terminus um, and then your little ribosome will again make another translocation. So this um, blue tRNA will move to the P site, your, um, and it will take on the growing polypeptide chain. And this um, P site um, tRNA that car that's carrying this phi guy, this will move to the ejection site, and it will not have anything bound to it. Again, that whole polypeptide chain is now occupied by this tRNA, which is going to occupy your P site. And then this guy will move to your E site and be ejected out. All right, so this will continue um, until you reach a stop codon. So there's three potential stop codons. There's, and that refers to the mRNA. Um, so the three stop codons for mRNA are UAG, UAA, and or UGA. So once one of those enter the A site, um, proteins called release factors will enter. Um, 
they will enter and bind at the A site into the stop codon. Now the release factors cause a water molecule to be added to the polypep sorry to the peptide chain or polypeptide chain instead of an amino acid. Um, and this hydrolyzes um, the peptide from your P site tRNA. So the polypeptide is released and the complex um, of your ribosome dissociates and um, that allows termination of translation. So here's a summary of all of that. And that's it for now. Thank you for listening. I hope I didn't put you to sleep.